okay we'll get started so uh, did you receive this you weren't in the previous class i don't think so okay okay so let's get started with the cyber security part of this course so we are done with all the preliminary materials which included knowing a lot about statistics and hypothesis testing. I'm assuming that all of you have looked at the assignments during the break, like during the previous week. Uh, you have probably executed a few codes within the assignment. You have looked into the simulating diagrams because from now on, every week there will be some assignment to be completed. And uh, if you haven't looked at that already, please, I highly encourage you to look into it because from today onwards, you will start doing those assignments. And some of those assignments are complicated and might take time if you're not familiar with Simulink or MATLAB coding, or you have forgotten about it uh, since you last uh, did MATLAB coding. So, okay. So today we are going to talk about uh, Markov chains. And once we study Markov chains, which is the subject of assignment one, the queuing assignment um, that, that we talked about in the previous class on Monday last week. So Markov chains is very closely related to this control systems uh, problem or the model. And then we will do change detection in Markov chain using log likelihood ratio test, uh, which is going to be uh, useful in attack detection for the problem that, for the first assignment problem that you guys are assigned. Okay, so remember we talked about control systems and we talked about this model. So this was the model, XT is the state, UT is the control action and WT is the noise. Uh, in the case of this building, XT is the temperature of the room. UT is how much cold air slash hot air is being pumped into the room. And then WT is the noise, which is how much solar radiation is coming in, what the weather outside is and all that stuff. So all the noise, I, I mean, how many people are inside the room? That's also a noise on this particular system. So this was the model that we talked about at the very beginning of this, this class in, in early September. Now, in many instances, for instance, in the queuing problem that I discussed in the previous week, uh, the state, so remember when I talk about temperature, what comes to your mind is a real number, right? So you think the temperature in terms of 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 71.5 degrees Fahrenheit. But in fact, if you closely think about it, you're not looking into like 20 decimal places of the temperature, you're just fine with the first decimal place. So 70.5 is good enough for you. Sometimes you don't even care about that 0 0.5, 70 is good enough or 71 is good enough for you. So what you're actually doing is discretizing the state space. Okay, so the actual temperature is a real number. So if you get a very sophisticated equipment and you try to measure the temperature of this room, you will probably get something which is accurate within the 500 decimal places. Okay, but we don't care about all those 500 decimal places. So what we do is we discretize the state space. Okay, and in some cases, the state space is already discretized. So for instance, in the queuing system, or if you're standing at Starbucks, and you want to look at the queue length of how many people are standing in the queue to place the order, uh, that's a discrete space in itself. That's by nature, like number of people, that's a discrete number. It has to be one, two, three, four, or sometimes even zero. So in some cases, this xt is a discrete variable. It is discrete because either in your mind or in your model, you have discretized it, as is the case with temperature, or the nature of the problem is discrete itself. How many packets are arriving? How many people are checking the emails? How many people are standing in the queue in Starbucks? And so on. So there is an alternate way to write this particular expression, which is how the state is evolving 
in those situations. And that is done through what is known as Markov chain, uh, actually controlled Markov chain. So let's assume that I have replaced ut with some policy gamma t of xt. So somebody looks at the current state and then determines what ut is. So then I can write it as xt plus 1 equals to f tilde t xt wt which is now say so gamma t is some policy now let's assume stationary behavior Then f tilde doesn't depend on t, and so we have xt plus 1 equals to ft, f tilde, sorry, no t, so f tilde doesn't depend on t. xt wt, and wt is iid. So I have a policy gamma t which looks at the current state and then determines what needs to be done, implements that action on the system and then the state evolves. So now I can just look at the state evolution because the policy is already fixed. There is already some policy that is being used to control the temperature of this room. We don't know what that policy is but it's already embedded within the programmable logic controllers PLCs within this room. or somewhere in the building, it's already programmed in there, that controller, that policy, okay? Uh, in the case of the queuing problem, join shortest queue, which was the policy we discussed in the previous lecture, so that was the policy that's fixed. So there is a bunch of requests coming in, so somebody wants to watch a YouTube video, somebody wants to check their email, and somebody wants to uh, just visit a website. Uh, and so that request comes in, those three requests comes in, and then the web server is trying to figure out, okay, there is a, the servers in Cleveland are underloaded and the servers in San Francisco are overloaded. So I'm going to send all these three requests to the servers in Cleveland to service the request. Okay, so that's the join the shortest queue policy. And that policy is also fixed. Okay, somebody fixed that policy at the web server end. And then that server is looking at the incoming requests and then figuring out what needs to be done based on that policy. So I've fixed the policy, I have the state transition function, and I've assumed stationarity. Stationarity means that my WT is IID, so my noise is uh, independent and identically distributed. It's a very strong assumption, but let me explain it to you in a bit. And then my XT is what it is, and my F tilde doesn't depend on time, so the time dependence is gone. So that will happen if FT doesn't depend on time and gamma T doesn't depend on time. So in the join the shortest queue policy, it doesn't really depend on time because it just looks at the current state, figures out whatever is the shortest queue and sends all the requests to that particular queue. Doesn't really look into the time. Like if it is morning, that's what I will do. If it is evening, I'm going to switch the strategy. That's not happens. what happens in that case. So if there is no time dependence here and there is no time dependence here, the state transition function doesn't depend on time then that's it, then it's a stationary problem. And of course, in, uh, so, so when would this assumption hold true? So consider this situation. So you know the weather, of course, changes over a day, right? So in the morning, it's cooler. During the day, it's a little warmer. And in the, in the evening, it becomes cooler. But if you look at the one hour time window, so 12 to 1 or 1 to 2 or 2 to 3, you can imagine that the weather or the temperature is almost IID. There is a mean, so right now the mean would be like 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 
and the actual temperature will fluctuate a little bit around that mean. So for smaller time scales, so over long time scales everything changes, but over smaller time scales, uh, you can assume you can you can consider the noise to be IID. Okay, it, it's 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 a fairly good assumption. So the way people check their emails, of course, has a diurnal pattern because uh, uh, well. Um, so older people sleep according to time and wake up according to time. I don't know what the situation right now with the student population at OSU is. But assuming everyone has this diurnal cycle where they sleep at night and they wake up during the morning, they will most likely check their emails in the morning, but they won't check their emails at night, barring a few people who are still awake at night. So in those situations, for the one hour window, you can assume that WT is IID, so how many people are checking their email every five minutes is an IID variable. But over long periods of time, which is over the 24 hour period, you can't really assume the IID-ness. I mean, that assumption will not hold true. So when I talk about stationary behavior, you have to figure out what time scale you are looking at. Are you looking at a slice of time, like maybe a five minutes interval, a one hour interval, or five hour interval where things are stationary uh, because over long periods of time, I know from my prior experience that everything is non-stationary. But over short periods of time, things may be stationary. Okay, so anyone has any questions on this stationary behavior thing? Okay, it's a time scale issue. Okay, so um, if you're driving on a highway, so once you are on the highway, everything is stationary. But once you get out of the highway, Everything depends on what the traffic light situation there is, what the traffic pattern in that particular locality is. Okay, so the stationary behavior changes as soon as you exit the highway. But on the highway, there is a certain kind of stationary behavior that you will be exposed to if you're driving a vehicle. So depending on situation, depending on context, you have to define in what time scale is the stationary behavior assumption correct. Okay, so for the time being, we are going to assume that things are stationary because you're looking at a particular time window where uh, all the noises are IID and the state transition function doesn't depend on time and the control policy doesn't depend on time. Okay, now I can, so WT is a random variable, F tilde is a fixed map that we all know, XT is the state. So I can actually represent Well, equals to J given XT equals to I. I I'm looking at this probability transition matrix, or so, sorry, a probability transition function, which would be given by the probability that F tilde I comma WT is equal to J given, well, that's it. I is already included there. Okay, so I can define this transition. This is known as a transition kernel, state transition and this is the connection between F tilde and the state transition kernel. And this XT here is called a module. Where is K? J, J. J is the new state. So if right now the temperature is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, what's the probability that temperature at the next time step is going to be 70.1 degrees Fahrenheit? So that's the J. J is 70.1 degrees Fahrenheit, I is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. 
or J could be 69.9 degrees Fahrenheit and I is whatever 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, so that's the definition of a Markov chain. Now the reason why it's called a Markov chain is because the state is discrete, it's I and J. If the state were continuous, then it would be called a Markov process. But then, uh, you know, I just prefer to call everything a Markov chain because it's so much easier. But uh, in some literature, uh, people call a real valued Markov chain is known as a Markov process and an integer valued Markov chain But it doesn't matter. Whenever you see a book or a, or a, or a paper, except that the range of x could be real numbers or it could be a integer depending on uh, whether it's called a Markov process. Okay. Any questions on this uh, state transition kernel? So state transition kernel is denoted by xt plus 1 equals to j given xt equals to i and it's the same as the probability that f tilde i comma wt is equal to j. Now I can write the state transition kernel in the form of a state transition matrix where I'm going to write pij And then I'm going to form a matrix, capital P, as P11, P12, P1N, PNN. So this is known as a state transition matrix. So I'm going to rename the state. So if I have, let me write it here. So I have a state space x 69.0, 69.1. Well, that's going to become too many numbers. 69.0, 70.0, 71.0, So this is my original state space. Uh, and I want to write it in a state transition matrix, so I have to reassign the state. So I'm going to call it state 1. I'm going to call it state 2. This will be state 3 and so on. Okay, so I'm reassigning the names of the state. So 69, 70, 71 is what we understand, but I'm going to rename it as 1, 2, and 3, and 4, and so on in the computer. And then I can write the state transition matrix in this particular format, okay?
This is known as enumeration, enumeration of the state space. So this process is known as enumeration. I have a whole bunch of states, discrete states, and I convert them into actual numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I keep that mapping in my head, or there is a database where this mapping is, is written explicitly. Okay, so every autonomous system that you would ever encounter, it is autonomous, so why is it autonomous? Well, it is autonomous because that system will have a sensing unit which will sense the current state, feed that information into the controller, which is going to look at all the information coming from sensors, perhaps run a few filters uh, in order to determine what the true state of the system is. And then it will pass on that information to the controller and the controller will take an action. And all of this is going to happen at millisecond scale. So there is no way on earth a human being can sit there and try and understand what is happening. And based on what is happening, uh, take a corrective action if something is going wrong. It's just infeasible to do it. In the case of communication system, these things are happening in a microsecond scale. In the case of autonomous vehicle, things are happening at millisecond, tens of milliseconds to hundreds of millisecond scale. And in the case of, I don't know, oil and natural gas plant, I don't quite know at what time scale they work, but perhaps I'm assuming that they are also working at 100 milliseconds or a few second scale. And these things are getting a lot of data, uh, doing this, uh, applying the policy, and then trying to figure out what the next state is. I mean, not trying to figure out, estimate what the next state is based on new sensor readings, and then redo all the calculation and execute the action all over again. Now, of course, when we are talking about this Markov chain theory, uh, I could teach this whole theory in like complete generality with very high dimensional state spaces and stuff. But the fact of the matter is, whenever you are worried about cybersecurity, you will be worried about a specific subsystem, okay? Not the whole thing. And therefore, the number of states, this n, which is the number of states here, I'm assuming it's not going to be very large. It could be 100, that's fine, but it cannot be a billion, okay? Then it becomes totally unmanageable. Uh, any questions? Yes. Where does that reflect here? Where is the time window that we are looking at in this process? So that's a, so this is the station, this is within the stationary window, but the time window that you are actually looking at depends from one problem to another. So if you're looking at weather, uh, weather doesn't change in one hour interval, but it changes over 24 hour interval. So for that one hour, you can assume that everything is stationary. Okay, so between, uh, let's say this class started at 1, 1.40 and it will end at 12.35. So within that window, 55 minutes window, everything is stationary. Everybody is sitting wherever they are. Uh, people are not, well, I'm moving around, but not that much, right? So everybody is sitting wherever they are and the outside weather is pretty much constant for this 55 minutes interval. And the air conditioning logic is also constant within this 55 minutes. That logic isn't changing. So you can assume that the system is stationary for this 55 minutes. And then the next class will start and then the entire system will change. The stationary behavior will change. The stationary behavior will change because I was gonna say That's that right. the, the system is running all the time. Correct. So when the, when the time, assume time interval Correct. finishes, That's you right. make another... Uh, That's right. You will come up with a new transition matrix for the updated state, okay? Uh, not the updated state, updated noise and updated transition function, whatever that may be. So in the case of this building, the transition function is not changing, it's the noise that is changing uh, after every hour. But uh, I'm trying to think of in what system the state transition function itself will change. Do you, can you think of some system where the transition function will change after some time? Maybe a vehicle on the road, so as soon as it enters the highway, uh, it changes the transition function. So now you're in a free flowing traffic. And all you have to do is figure out in which lane to drive, but that's a state triggered. It's actually state triggered, not really time triggered, but 
whatever. The, the thing is that the transition function itself is changing after certain event happens and after that it's stationary for some time until you exit at, the, at wherever the exit is. I'm still kind of thinking where exactly would there be a time triggered change in the state transition function. What happens when there is morning, like 7 a.m.? Something changes at 7 a.m. What would change? Okay, forget it. Uh, I'm sure something, there are systems where uh, the state transition function itself will change uh, at a certain specific time. Like after that time, the transition function is different. Uh, of course, we did talk about the noise. The noise statistics itself may change um, at, the, at the onset of certain time step. Okay. You know, I read somewhere that as soon as people go home, they turn on Netflix slash Amazon Prime slash any of these streaming online streaming services. So there is a huge spike in the number of people wanting to watch videos as soon as they go home. And um, maybe that's also a WT, a change in WT. At 5, at 5 p.m., suddenly WT changes. The noise statistics change because everybody is home. Um, but that's again WT, not F, till, uh, not FT. So anyways, uh, yeah. So depending on the situation at hand, you can assume that within a time window, uh, you are in a stationary situation and you can compute the state transition matrix for that particular time step, okay? Now, let's assume that there is an attack on the system. And there are two situations that could happen. One in which case, one case is you exactly know what kind of attack may happen and you know how exactly is this F tilde going to change under the attack. So here is my old system. I'm, I'm going to call it pre-attack system. So that is xt plus 1 equals to f of xt gamma of xt wt. So wt is stationary, f is stationary, gamma is stationary. Okay, all three of them are stationary. And then there is post attack, where you could have situation one. Xt plus one equals to, I have used F tilde, Fa. Okay, let me use Fa, Xt, gamma A, Xt, Wt, or situation two, Xt is, I don't know, garbage. I shouldn't say garbage data. I'll just keep, continue to write it. It's garbage data or unknown F slash gamma slash noise distribution. Okay, so what are the two different situations you see? So pre-attack, we know everything, okay? We have, we have worked with the system for 20 years, we understand everything about the system. Pre-attack, there is no problem. Post-attack, there could be two situations. In the first situation, I exactly know what the state transition function under the attack model is, 
and I exactly know what the control policy under the attack model is. And because I know this thing, I know exactly what situation I'm going to encounter in the post-attack phase. The second situation is more complicated. So, and it's actually more commonplace. I don't know what attack I'm going to see on my air conditioning system. I know that eventually somebody would want to attack the system uh, because it, uh, it's very uh, financially beneficial for the attacker. So somebody will attack this at some point of time, but I don't quite know what exactly is the attack that's going to, going to happen, okay? So in that case, I'm looking at XT, but I, I, I just don't know what, what I'm seeing, okay? Because it's, it's coming from some random model that I have absolutely no idea about because I don't know what attacker is trying to do in order, to, in order for me to see this particular data. So one of course, one situation is spoofing. So I'm just, the attacker is just changing XT. So the system is working as intended, but the, the thing that I'm seeing on the dashboard is completely different from what the actual situation is. And that's because the data, data stream from the sensor to my computer has been hacked and somebody is changing that data stream. Now, I'll give you one example of that because it's a very important case study for when nature attacks. So there was this uh, airline that was going from Rio to Paris. I probably have mentioned this before uh, in the beginning of the class. Uh, so what happened, so you know how the air pressure is measured? It's through a pitot tube. Pitot tube is like a, it's a tube that looks like this. And this is the airflow. This is known as pitot tube. This is the airflow. So the, the air passes inside and then there is a pressure here and then there is a pressure outside and it measures the differential of the pressure and figures out at what speed the air is flowing. Okay, that's a pitot tube. And uh, it's been used in the airline industry for like millions, not millions of years, uh, maybe like 40, 50 years. <laughs> uh, so it's very common to use pitot tubes. Now there was this flight going from Rio to uh, Paris and what happened was there was a storm when the flight was taking off and because of the storm there were water droplets all over the place within and outside of the pitot tube and then the flight went to the steady state 30,000 feet or whatever and all these became ice crystals okay now when they become ice crystals they are obstructing the airflow from going inside the pitot tube Okay, so what do you think is going to happen? I'm going to get garbage data, okay? It's a nature attacking the system. Uh, now, of course, it's not called a cyber attack because it's nature who's attacking it. When humans attack, it's a cyber attack. When nature attacks, it's a fault. Uh, but in this case, let's assume that it's a cyber attack from nature, which is changing the sensor information coming to the pilot. And so the pilot is say, thinking, uh, so what is pilot seeing on the dashboard? On the dashboard, it says that the, the flight is going downwards or something, okay? So it, there is some, some logic inside the airplane and it was telling the pilot that the flight is going down towards the sea. So what, the, what, would, what would a pilot do? The pilot will try to nose up the plane, okay? And so the pilot was trying to put the nose up of the plane by looking at this information. But in fact, the flight was actually in steady state condition. So pilot started putting it, pulling it up and it started climbing up. And then it went to what is known as a deep stall, which means that uh, the wings were basically useless at that time. And then the plane just crashed into the sea and all 250 people died on board. Now, that is the situation where so Boeing knows all about faults that could happen, okay? But they didn't know about this particular fault that could have happened. They didn't think about it when they were designing the airplane and when they were writing the logic for the pitot tube. So in that situation, they were in this garbage data case where they didn't know how this data is getting generated. And so they told pilot, you know, 
go control the plane, it's not my problem anymore. But you know, pilots are limited in what they are seeing on the dashboard, especially at the middle of the night when they cannot really see what's going around all over the place. So they did what they could, but you know, it was already too late. Uh, so, so as a cybersecurity engineer, of course, your supervisor will tell you these are the attacks that we expect to happen. And your job would be to think, OK, under the attack, what's going to be the state transition function? What's going to be the control policy? How's the state going to evolve? And then based on that, you will come up with a detection strategy, which we are going to talk about now. In situation two, where XT is some garbage data with coming out of a known F, a known gamma, and a known noise distribution, then you are in a very sticky situation. And we will talk about how to detect an attack in this particular situation. <coughs> this part, which is uh, detecting an attack when you don't quite know how XT is getting generated. So our research group is actually working on this problem. Uh, because this problem is very well understood. This problem is where a lot of understanding is needed. And we are developing new algorithms to, to deal with this particular situation, where we don't quite know what the attacker is trying to do. Um, OK. So let's look at situation one. So I know the pre-attack case. I know exactly how the model is supposed to, how the system is supposed to work. And in the post-attack situation, I already know somebody told me what attacks I should be expecting on the system. And therefore, I'm developing an algorithm to detect whether such an attack is happening or not. OK. So just like for this f and this gamma, you came up with a probability transition matrix. For f a and gamma a, I can go through the same analysis, and I can, I can come up with a, another probability transition matrix. Let me call it p a. I have to make it capital P. State transition matrix. Under attack. OK. Yes, please. Gamma A is the control policy under, under attack. Under attack. It's yes. not like the mitigated control. Yeah, it's not mitigated. We are, call, we are talking about detection yeah. in, in until maybe uh, late, uh, early November. So imagine in that particular flight, if the pilot was told that please don't trust the sensors, OK? It would have been so much easier for pilots to make a decision. The problem was they trusted the sensors. That was the key issue that came out of the entire uh, analysis that pilots trust the system too much. And they shouldn't be trusting the system too much. But I don't quite know what I'm going to trust in the middle of night when everything is dark all over the place. It's a hard problem. I'm, I'm not discounting the fact that it's a very, very hard problem to solve. So now I have a Markov chain, and I want to detect an attack. You can pretty much use the same thing for fault detection as well. But we are talking about attack detection here. So I have, an, uh, I have a system. Somebody, I have modeled the system, and I know that P is the state transition matrix uh, pre-attack, pre-attack transition matrix. And PA is post-attack 
transition. Let me call it Q instead of P A. Post attack transition matrix. And I'm looking at data. So I, I, I'm, uh, I'm sitting on my computer and all I see is sensor readings, okay? So I'm seeing X0, I see X1, I see X2, I see XT. This is what I'm seeing on my dashboard, okay? <clears throat> what is the H0? And what is the alternate hy hypothesis? I need to come up with two hypotheses. What do you think are the two hypotheses in this case? What is H0? The null hypothesis. Yeah, these are the states. This is what you're seeing on the dashboard. This is what the pilots are seeing on the airplane screen, right? The current state. You're seeing a sequence of states, X0, X1, X2, X3. As time progresses, you're seeing the graph going up and down and all that stuff. This is what you're seeing. And what is your goal as a cybersecurity engineer? You need to come up with an algorithm to detect the attack, okay? So what's my H0 and what's my HA in this case? You are talking about test statistics, not the hypothesis. <coughs> Perfect, yeah. So the hypothesis is that X T T equals zero to capital T is coming from P and the alternate hypothesis is is coming from Q. So my states are getting generated from P, which is the known pre-attack transition probability, transition matrix, or alternatively, my state is coming from Q, which is uh, post-attack transition matrix. Now, of course, the attack is going to happen at some unknown time within this time period. So I'm looking at uh, 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. interval, and the attacker is going to start attacking at uh, 12.47 p.m., okay? So there is some specific time when the attacker attacks. And so you don't necessarily want to know if going from time t equals to zero to t, it is coming from q, you actually want to detect if it is starting, well, not tau, let me use new, new. So there is some time new at which the state transition matrix has changed to post attack case, okay? So you could be for some new. So it would be wrong to think about the entire sequence coming from Q, okay? Because the attacker is not just sitting and start, he, he or she will start attacking at 12.30 p.m. He, will, he or she is gonna pick a time and it will start attacking at that time. So, so there is a time new at which the attack starts. And the goal is that for some new, this particular sequence is coming from the post attack transition matrix Q. Now, depending on, let's say, your supervisor tells you these are the six attacks that I expect to happen. So you will have Q1 to Q6, and you will be running six alternate, six uh, parallel hypothesis tests on your computer. So you will either have six different processors for each hypothesis test, or you will have a single pr processor running multiple threads, and in each of the threads, it is basically running some hypothesis test of, uh, the data coming from P or the data coming from Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, Q5, and Q6. Okay. Now, this is a problem that I need to solve, and I need to come up with a test. So this is the hypothesis test that I need to uh, figure out how to 
reject the null hypothesis or reject the alternate hypothesis. <coughs> Sorry. So what I have to come up with is the test statistics and the rejection region. Okay, those are the two things that are that are uh, needed. So here is the uh, Q sum Q sum algorithm based on log likelihood. ratio test so i'm going to define sk to n oh this is capital t well it's fine so uh, zero less than equal to k less than equal to n less than equal to capital T. So this is the Q sum score. This is known as Q sum score. Oh, actually this is not known as the Q sum score. The, the next thing would be known as the Q sum score. Okay, so I have a score uh, where I look at the tail, so t goes from k to n. Uh, I take the log of qij over pij for xt equals to i and xt plus 1 equals to j, so that's the indicator function. <coughs> so you can actually, uh, I can rewrite this skn as t equals to k to n log of q xt xt plus 1 over p xt xt plus 1. It's the same expression. Okay, this is more uh, mathematically elegant way to write it. This is somewhat less elegant way to write it. <coughs> But 
but this is easy to understand. So you're looking at the, uh, you have these two matrices, you look at the xth row and xt plus 1th column for q and then for p, and then you take their ratio, take the log, sum it up. Okay, that's the log likelihood ratio. And then your detection strategy is, so at time n, so let n be defined as infimum over all n such that max 0 less than k less than n <coughs> greater than equals to c. So this is my q sum score. This is my threshold. And so, um, <clears throat> so you're looking at n, and the first time this score becomes greater than the threshold, you raise an alarm that there is an adversary in the system, okay? Or there is, with high probability, there is an adversary in the system. So you have accepted you have rejected the null hypothesis. So at time n, reject the null hypothesis. K is uh, some inter, so you look at, so K goes from 0 to N, okay, so N is your current time step or actually for N you need to know Xn plus 1 as well. So N is perhaps like a once time time step later, so, so you look at, so you compute Skn for every K all the way until current time step and you look at the max, and if the max exceeds the threshold, then you say that you reject the null hypothesis. So you have a lot of readings, different readings here. Okay. And this is how you compute SK n. You know, in the interest of clarity, let me write it as n minus 1, because there is an xt plus 1 here. So I just want to say that n is the current time step and not a future time step. It's, it's just so much easier. So just make n minus 1 here in SKN and n minus 1 here and then we are good. Then n is the current time step. <clears throat> okay. So this is the way to detect whether an attack is happening or not. So you need to have the attack model. You need to know what this, how the system is going to behave under the attack. And once you know that, you will know the transition probability for the attack case, transition probability for the uh, pre-attack case. Uh, you can compute this uh, score, which is summation of log likelihood. And then you pick the time n which is the minimum n, small n, such that the max of this sum is greater than or equal to a threshold. Now you can bump up and down the threshold depending on what false alarm rate or what type 1 error or type 2 error is desired. That's completely up to you. Okay, so this threshold 
you have to tune it. Um, of course, uh, in, in our research, we have to be very careful about the threshold and we need to come up with appropriate bounds for the threshold. But in reality, you just have to do it by hand and, and do a little bit of trial and error to figure out what threshold you should set so that you don't have too many false alarms. Now, one of the situation in, in, the, in the real world why this, is, this threshold is important, if every day people get alarm that there is an attack, there is an attack, there is an attack, there is an attack, but there is no attack because of the type 1 or type 2 error, then people will just become complacent and they would, even if there is an actual attack, they will just say, okay, it's just sending false alarms. So that's why threshold is important. If every day you drive your vehicle and you, it has a check engine light on because there is some false alarm inside the vehicle, then at some point of time you will just ignore the check engine light completely, which is what I'm doing right now. <laughs> uh, it says that maintenance is required. I'm just ignoring it. <laughs> okay. Um, this issue, this threshold issue, or this anomaly detection, it also happens in ICU. So if you go to, I mean, I hope you don't have to go to ICU, but if you do, you will see that there are like alarms going on and off every time. The heart rate is going up, the heart rate is going down, whatever BP is going up, BP is going down and all that stuff. And many a times, nurses have become so used to those alarms that they just tend to ignore it. And there was an accidental case in San Francisco where the dose, the, there was a small child in ICU and she was supposed to be given certain ML of medicine but it was 10 times that dosage uh, that was inputted in the computer. The computer said, sent an alarm signal that, hey, the dose looks incorrect. But because the nurses see so many alarms during the day, they just hit enter. And the 10x amount of medicine went into the bloodstream of that particular patient. The patient survived, but that was the worst 24 hour or 48 hour period for that particular hospital where everyone from top to bottom was just waiting to see what, what the patient's reaction is going to be. So false alarm is important, okay? Don't, don't ignore the false alarm because if there is a human operator, they would press enter, 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 enter and just forget about it. So uh, be, be aware of this false alarm rate. And the way to check the false alarm rate is by this threshold. You can move it up and down to alter the false alarm rate. Okay, so all well and good in this case. Uh, you have had, uh, you know the post-attack situation, you know the pre-attack situation. You have set up the test statistics. You have looked at the QSUM score. You have appropriately tuned the threshold. And at time n, whenever it's reached, you can reject the null hypothesis. Hopefully it will never be reached and the system will be working normally and you won't raise any alarms in the process. Okay. <clears throat> now comes the second, oh, the time is up. Okay, so in the next class, we are going to talk about the second situation where I don't know what this transition kernel is. Okay, so I don't know what's going to happen in the post-attack situation. So we'll, we'll talk about it in the next class. I apologize for overshooting. <laughs>